imagine what it will be. It's lovely. Uh, good morning again, everyone. Good morning. Good morning again. So we continue on our sermon series, No, um, no Insignificant Question. The topic today is privilege and the gospel. We'll be reading today from Philippians chapter 2, 1 through 11. I invite you to open, open your hearts and your minds to this reading of God's word. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation in love, any sharing of the spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And may God bless to us our reading and our understanding and our applying of this word to how we live our lives. Uh, so uh, there's a story. There, there are a couple of different versions of the story, but the general outlines are the same. There's a teacher uh, lecturing in a public place, uh, the main school and civic building in the city, and the teacher has become quite famous. He's provocative and edgy and iconoclastic. The teacher is talking about their country, right, their faith, their congregation, and their communities, and he's upset that people take advantage of one another using their positions of authority and responsibility to profit from them, instead of using that authority and that responsibility to make the lives of ordinary people better. I mean, I mean how dare they? It's, it's not right. It's not what our rules, our laws say is supposed to happen. It's not okay to take advantage of people. One version of the story says that the listeners were spellbounded by his teaching, and the other said that they listened to him with delight. It's enough to make any preacher jealous, you know what I mean? And, and some other people also apparently were jealous too, those very people in positions of authority and responsibility, they were not happy. And so they came up to him and they started challenging, what gives you the right, man? Who said that you could come in here and talk about us like that? And so the story goes, the teacher didn't blink an eye, he fends them off and he says that he'll answer their questions if they can answer one of his first. Uh, John, you, you know, the guy that baptized all those people in the desert, was John doing that because God was with him, you know, guiding him, empowering him, or was he doing all of that on his own? And they really couldn't answer him, you know, because, because this was a public spectacle by now. The bystanders all had their cell phones out, and they were recording video, and they were ready to upload it to Facebook and Twitter and Insta, and the accusers are worried. I mean, because the crowds, they loved John. I mean, they loved him. The dude lived in the desert and ate locusts and wild honey, and he sought to serve people, love people, heal people, point them to God. And if they answered the way that they truly felt, I mean, they didn't like John. They didn't think that God was on his side. I mean, come on, really. And if they answered that way, the crowds would turn on them for sure. So they didn't answer. They were silent, the story says. And the teacher kind of smiles at that and, and told the crowds a little story and kept right on teaching. And so they tried again. They sent people to try to trap him in the same sort of question. You know, hey, Jesus, uh, you teach the way of God and the truth, and, and I want to know, is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? I mean, they figured, hey, the people with their cell phones recording all of this, they hate taxes, right? They hate the emperor. And the Romans were making their lives miserable. So we got him, just like he tried to get us with that weird, painful question about John. And the teacher reached for a coin, and he asked those around them, whose picture is on this thing? Well, the emperor's mug is on that coin, the crowd answered. Give to the emperor what's the emperor's, and to give to God what is God's. Oh, snap, goes the crowd. Did you see that? 
And, 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 and you can see why they were delighted by all of this. And those people who tried to trap him, the stories all say they fell silent. They didn't try anything more after that, at least not for a little while. And the teacher keeps on teaching and started digging just a little bit more on those people of power and authority who were coming to challenge him, going so far once to say this. In the hearing of all the people, Jesus said to the disciples, beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and love to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and have the best seats in the synagogues, the places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses. And for the sake of appearances, they say long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. Which is a rather astonishing thing to say about the scribes, who were well-respected, essential in everyday society, without whom business and education and daily life would kind of drag to a halt. Most people don't know how to write, after all. And the scribes keep the whole economy, keep everything going. And apparently, well, they knew it, those scribes. Or at least they felt to be, uh, that they deserved to be treated well because of it. And then the teacher is done. And he sits down over by the treasury uh, where there already is a large crowd just sitting there. And everyone is watching people come up and make their tithes and their offerings to the temple. Can you imagine that? Everyone sitting around for sport watching the gifts that other people are making to charity. And the story ends with Jesus looking up, seeing the rich people striding in with their gifts, proud and loving it, maybe a little pretentious, one by one by one. But look, here's something different. It, it's a widow. And she looks, well, poor. I mean, her clothes, her gait, everything about her shows that she's out of place, but she's determined, right? She walks up and she places two copper coins in that box and they rattle around in there with a loud noise like they don't quite fit and the teacher is astonished look he says truly this poor widow has put in more than than all of them for they have contributed out of their abundance but she out of poverty has put in all that she has to live on some people uh, call that last part of the story the lesson of the widow's might have you heard of that story. It's found in the Gospels of Matthew and of Luke, the end of this full day of teaching by Jesus. Uh, the mite is the name of the coin that she put into the treasury box. It was the smallest coin, quote, the smallest and least valuable coin in circulation in Judea, worth about six minutes of an average daily wage. That was all that she had to live on. We refer to it, the music staff's going to be upset because we could have sung this today. We refer to it someday when we, we sing the song, Take My Life and Let It Be, right? With the lyric, take my silver and my gold, not a mite would I withhold. Take my intellect and use every power as thou shalt choose, every power as thou shalt choose. And take my love, my Lord, I pour at thy feet its treasure store. Take myself and I will be ever only all for thee, ever only all for thee. I know, they're mad at me now. Sorry about that, guys. <laughs> Um, one of the things that got Jesus into trouble was how he was not afraid to tackle and to, and to take on powerful people, their pride and their hubris and their use of power to get what they want at the expense of others. But Jesus was an equal opportunity critic, it seems to me, when you look more deeply into it. It wasn't just those scribes or the Pharisees or the wealthy who were watching each other's charitable donations for sport. Jesus also turned his spotlight to examine the hearts of everyone close to him. I mean, Karen read this story today about the disciples, right, jockeying for power, worried about their seats at the table, wanting to sit at the right and the left hand of their beloved leader, Jesus. And two of them had a mother who could just walk right in and see what strings she could pull. Um, maybe you've seen the ABC sitcom, The Goldbergs, and like me, you heard, when you heard Karen reading this story, you saw in your mind's eye Beverly Goldberg taking care of her three kids, marching into the principal's office or to her son's boss at work or to her daughter's boyfriend's house to give someone a piece of her mind, right? Come on, Jesus, my boys are the best boys. Let them sit at your right hand, which is Bible speak, for give my boys the best jobs, the really great opportunities. Come on, do it for me, Jesus. You do not know what you're asking 
before. Jesus could only say to her, rolling his eyes, for whoever wants to be great in my world, in God's world, must become a servant and give up all that aspiration, all that glory, all that status, all that privilege that the world gives out. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Today's significant question is about privilege. What do you think about when you hear that term? What is privilege? Privilege um, is some advantage that you have, you or a group that you belong to, earned or unearned, known or maybe something you don't even recognize. The topic that was submitted for this sermon series just said that one word, privilege, and it certainly fits because Jesus taught and preached and worked a lot to point out the problems of unrecognized, uncritical privilege. Someone once said this week, to have privilege means you get to go to the front of the line, which is as good a way as any uh, to think about it. Uh, There was one year, for instance, that I flew so much that I had gold status on United Airlines. Gold status. It even sounds like privilege, right? Not quite as much as platinum status does, but gold. And it was sweet. You certainly could board the plane first. You got a little extra leg room. You felt just a little bit more important, too, because you got that prized overhead bin space, and you got to watch people come in after you, even though you're on the same tin can as everyone else. Now, a sermon about privilege has the potential of being a hard sermon for us to hear. Because we are all people with a certain amount of privilege, and some of us have a lot of privilege. And Jesus has some critical things to say about this, and we don't do well hearing that sort of thing. We have the potential of either tuning out or being defensive when we talk about it. But I'm not sure that we should though, to say that there are privileges in our world, that there are some who get those and some who don't. It's like talking about the air that we breathe. It's just our reality. We can take it personally or we can try to understand it and try to think about what we can do about it. I don't know if it's obvious to you, but but some of the sermons that I write are mainly written to myself. They're the kind of things that I know that I need to hear and maybe you might hear something faithful in them too. And certainly a sermon about privilege fits that type of sermon, a sermon written about myself, not just because I made gold status one year on United. I am well-educated and male and white and straight and Protestant, which, believe it or not, still opens quite a few doors these days. I'm a homeowner. I don't worry where my next meal will come from. I'm able-bodied and a hard worker, and I've made good choices for most of my life, choices that were supported by laws and an economy that rewards such things. By some fate, I was born in Louisville, Kentucky, not Honduras or Angola or Bangladesh or the Solomon Islands or this week, let's say the Bahamas. Born to parents who were married and who still are today, who doted over my education and showered me with affection and worried about my self-esteem who helped me focus enough to get into a good college. I have insurance and a pension and savings accounts. I've never been followed around a store by anyone thinking that I was going to shoplift. I don't worry very much that if my kids are pulled over by the police for speeding, if I am ever pulled over for speeding, that the interaction is going to go badly for some reason. I've never been told to go back to where I came from insulted for the language that I speak or the way that I pray or mocked because of the way that I dress, most of the time, people will listen to my arguments and will give them a fair consideration. In almost every category, I am about as privileged as they come. And some of that I may have worked hard to attain, right? And other parts of that I did nothing to earn or to merit or to acquire. It just happened maybe without me even thinking about it at all or noticing it at all, which itself is a sort of privilege when you think about it. And most of us, even when life is hard, when we struggle you know, with an income or with work or with relationships 
we nevertheless have many, many benefits alongside those struggles. And, and we often resent people telling us about those benefits because those struggles are real, and they are. But we still live in a country awash with privilege, and we all gain some of it just because of that. Are these bad things, though? I mean, a savings account, a good education, a good home? Not worrying about being stereotyped as a shoplifter in a store or whether an, an altercation or interaction with the police is going to go badly? No, they're not bad things. The point isn't to start tearing all of it down, but, but Jesus went a long way to challenge us when we start leaning on our privilege and don't recognize that everyone ought to have a good education or a good home, or opportunities for a savings account, or not being branded a thief for no real reason other than the color of their skin. I mean, Jesus did a lot of work here. He, he lifted up the widow, dropping those two mites into the coffers, because he knew that the people watching all this didn't think that she had given more than they had, even though she had. She gave everything. Jesus told stories about parties where the poor and the outcasts were welcome to sit at the table. Jesus said the people who were given 10 talents were expected to put those resources to good use, to God's use. He said, to whom much is given, much will be required. Jesus told his disciples that the work that they would have to accomplish meant giving up, but not having the best seat on the airplane. Jesus' lesson, whether it was to the powerful Pharisees and the scribes or to his disciples or to the crowds or to anyone with ears to hear, seems to be that we need to be aware of our power and our privilege and where we have it to give it away, to use it constructively so that other people without it can have a flourishing human life too, to step back so that other people can step up, to give up the powerful position so that other people can share in it. And Paul, Paul, when talking about Jesus, made, made the same point about how Jesus was of the same form and likeness as God herself, the very same, but didn't see that as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, Jesus did, taking the form of a servant, obedient all the way to the cross. Jesus, Paul says, was the most privileged of them all, in a sense. And Jesus leveraged that power and that privilege to serve others, particularly the poor and the oppressed and the hurting and the suffering and the estranged from God. And in doing so, Jesus opened the door to eternal life for everyone. This is something that mattered a lot to Jesus. He wanted us to stop jockeying for position, to stop flaunting our advantages and our successes, and to just start building up relationships and loving one another. You know, I've had a lot of people ask me what we can do to help out in these stressful times, and the best answer that I can think of is to look at Jesus and think about the ways that we might do like him the best we can. Ask ourselves, what are the advantages that I have? What are the things that I might not see, that log in my own eye that gives me a leg up or a benefit or that keeps other people struggling? And then what can I do to expand access just a little bit and step out of the way? What can I do to use my particular strengths and gifts and advantages for the good of others? Now, the good news is we have a lot of people who do that and who are working hard at that. And I want to end on a positive note, an example of how we can see this and use it and, and turn our privilege upside down. And I was going through some old video on my computer and I came across a new story. It's a simple story about a widow and about three men and a recognition of the privilege of belonging, of connection, and what they could do about it. Here's, here's the video. We end with a sweet and tender southern barbecue experience. Steve Hartman serves it up on the road. For barbecue lovers, Brad's Barbecue in Oxford, Alabama is heaven on earth. But eight-year-old Eleanor Baker says her visit here earlier this month was especially divine. I think it was a God thing. I think God sent me there. You think we needed the example? Yes. That people care about other people and how important it is. <laughs> Eleanor is a widow. 
She lives with her dog, Rufus. And although she has a big family, they mostly live out of town. So Eleanor was alone the night she went to Brad's barbecue. Security footage shows her entering there in the purple. And at about that same time, these three young men arrived. They say they were just having a good old time. We were all just sitting there just talking. When Jamario Howard noticed Eleanor. An older woman sitting by herself. Jamario says he hates seeing people eat alone. And I've seen that. When most of us see someone eating alone, we feel that way. But our sympathy never solves anything. And Jamario really wanted to fix this. So he got up from his table and sat at hers. He just came up and he said, I saw you sitting over here alone. And he said, do you mind having some company? And she said, go right ahead. And then I introduced myself and she introduced herself. And that's kind of how it all got started. They all ended up having dinner together. And it was just a really nice, pleasant evening. What those 20-somethings did that night speaks volumes about their character. <laughs> they say it wasn't entirely altruistic. <laughs> they enjoyed her company as much as she enjoyed theirs. Because when we looked at it, it's all we talked about. When you make that kind of connection with somebody, it's hard to let it go. Like, I already feel like we're her grandkids. <laughs> so you got room for these guys in your life? Of course. I'm so doing? glad y'all could make it. They have all vowed to make room for one another. <laughs> and certainly, if Eleanor's right, that God played any role in this, it may be to remind us of the joy that awaits just outside the bubbles we live in. I used to say when I was younger, and I still say today, like, I'm going to change the world somehow. And I don't know how, because I'm not rich, I'm not famous, and I'm not very smart either, so <laughs> I can't be the president. But we can show the world that it's all right to be kind, and then before long, maybe the world be a much better place. <laughs> Amen. Steve Hartman, on the road, in Oxford, Alabama. Now, don't get hung up on their eating Alabama barbecue. We know that's not really barbecue, right? <laughs> Friends, thanks be to God for people who seek to cross these human boundaries so that we can get to know each other and love one another and grow together into the realm of God. Jesus came to break down our human structures that advantage some at the expense of others so that all may know God's peace and God's safety. There's so much to talk about with privilege, but let's just say this. May we seek to understand how privilege works in our world and in our own life, the kinds of advantages that we each may have, and how we might not only give God thanks for how they help make our life more secure, but seek to give those away so that others may live and thrive. May we seek to understand that all that we have, in the end, comes from God, the God who made us and loves us and encourages us all, so that together we might make the realm of God possible. May it be so. Amen.